All right. Hello, everybody. It's Thursday late afternoon. Um, wasn't able to make it for our usual time. I wasn't up to par, but um, we're going to talk about respiratory system today. Um, if you look at the schedule, I've got three days for covering respiratory. Um, this first one, I'll probably get through about half of it, maybe a little bit more. We'll finish up the second half on Monday. Um, we'll cover uh, the second respiratory lecture on Tuesday. Um, we do have an exam on the 17th. Um, so, well, we'll see how it goes. We'll probably have, we definitely will have some time for a review. Um, possibly if I get through more today, um, that'll free up the 16th for review. But anyway, I will be sending out some study guides um, probably sometime over the weekend. So let me just write something down here. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's see, oops. All right, so as you guys know, today we're going to talk about the respiratory systems, a real comparative discussion, much like the cardiovascular system was. Now, generally with respiration, the respiratory system, um, it, obviously one of the things that it involves, it involves the movement of respiratory gases from one medium to another, whether it's from the air into the blood, whether it's from the blood to the tissues, whether it's from the tissues to the blood and the, and the blood out into the air. Whatever the case is, all that movement of gases is dependent upon primarily diffusion. Um, it does talk about sometimes active transport, but that's kind of few and far between. The bulk of any sort of gas transport involves movement from a high concentration of the gas. Here is oxygen to a low concentration, high to low, much like the movement of blood from high to low, high pressure, low pressure. Here we're looking at CO2, and if you notice the direction of these two movements, um, they move in opposite directions. Obviously, we're moving oxygen from the outside into the blood to the tissues. CO2, being a metabolic waste, is being moved out. We don't want that to accumulate. Gets back into the blood, ends up going back to the heart, and of course, as you guys know, goes into the pulmonary artery where we can breathe it out. That depends on a functional, we call a gas exchange membrane or an exchange surface, which has to be extremely thin to allow for diffusion. Thin surface, well vascularized, are the hallmarks for any sort of respiratory membrane. All right, so when we talk about the respiratory system, um, we talk about respiration and Respiration, of course, involves the movement of gases. Well, we can divide that up into two main components. One is known as external respiration. So basically, I'm speaking about advanced animals here as far as all the different components. But in the case of external respiration, we're moving oxygen from the outside, from the lungs, into the blood by diffusion. Once it's in the blood, of course, it goes back to the heart. It's pumped out, goes to the organs, again, from a high concentration in the blood to a low concentration in the tissues. Once, it's, once the oxygen is in the tissues, of course, that is converted into CO2, and CO2 builds up, and that moves back to the heart. This process right here that occurs within the tissues is known as internal respiration. All these other components from the atmosphere to the lungs, to the blood, and from the blood to the tissues, that's all, um, that's all external. And then from once it's in the tissues, the conversion is internal from oxygen, food and oxygen and CO2. All right, so this is kind of elaborating on that. 
um, when we're talking about the movement of gases, and again, this applies to all animals, um, here we're looking at, for example, these numbers. These numbers represent partial pressures. And it's gonna vary from animal to animal, but one of the things you can clearly see is that oxygen coming in, say from the outside world into the lungs, we'll call that the lung medium, is about 100, um, 100 um, millimeters of mercury. And that goes into the blood, which, which is at, at a much lower level. So it goes from a high concentration to low. CO2, in contrast, goes in the opposite direction. So basically what I want to mention here is just knowing the fact that blood is, our oxygen is going from a high concentration to a low concentration. All right. Just keep that in mind as far as the movement of gases. Now we're going to take a look at the evolution or development or the, the differences between different respiratory structures, different animals. And we're going to go from the very simple to the very complex. Here's an example of a protista, or basically a, a small organism, protozoan, that depends basically on oxygen just diffusing across the plasma membrane. If you think of this as the plasma membrane, oxygen just simply goes across this way, CO2 goes out. You don't need anything more complex, you don't, don't need lungs, you don't need gills, because it's a very small organ and the distance oxygen has to go is very, very short. So simple diffusion is how oxygen is transported. I should say oxygen and CO2 are transported in the opposite directions. Some animals, and this is showing worms, but there is some semblance of it also in some amphibians, is that there's um, diffusion across the skin. So the epithelium, the epidermis, um, oxygen can diffuse across from the outside in and, and CO2 from the inside out. So these are in, in larger multicellular organisms. So it's more complex. We're not just looking at one-celled organism. We're looking at multicellular organism, organisms. In this case, this is the type of um, aquatic worm. But like I said, it also occurs in other animals as well. As animals got more complex, and also their, their demand, when I say complex, what they're capable of doing, their metabolic demands, necessitated the development of respiratory structures that, were a, that needed to be more efficient in pulling oxygen out of the environment, bringing it in, and by the same token, moving CO2 out. Um, this is an example of of gills, what we call external gills, in some of the larger aquatic animals. And one of the things that you'll hear me talking about as we go along, as the animals got more complex, get more complex, they need more oxygen moved across. And what, a lot, what, what that requires is a greater surface area. Much like when we're talking about the blood going from arteries to arterioles, to capillaries. Remember the increased branching and the multitude and the number of 40 billion capillaries, like I mentioned in a, in a typical person. Um, that number and in size increases the surface area so you can exchange more oxygen. Gills, in this case, are getting much more complex, greater surface area than what you see in here. Then we also have invaginated. So these are what we call evaginated respiratory surfaces, meaning they're sticking out from the animal. Then we also have invaginated respiratory surfaces. This happens to be an example of an insect, terrestrial animal, and all their respiratory structures are located inside the body. Now there's a very good reason for that, and that has to do with the fact that in a terrestrial environment where this insect lives, um, this animal is vulnerable to dehydration, right? like we all are. We live in a terrestrial environment. So in order to prevent the drying out of our respiratory structures, we need them to be internalized. So in this case, in insects, we have what are called trachea, these tubes, 
in us, obviously, we have lungs or another example of that. So it really depends on the environment. Animals that live in an aquatic environment don't have to worry about drying out, right? Because they're surrounded by water. Their respiratory structures can be external. All right. And expanding on that, another example of an invaginated respiratory surface would be the lungs. Um, terrestrial vertebrates such as reptiles, right? Birds, mammals, and even some amphibians. All right, so this is kind of showing an example of kind of a, a general schematic of what these structures look like. Um, obviously, we're looking at some of the more advanced structures, starting with gills. Gills could be of one of two types. We can have the external gills, like we saw over here. We can also have internal gills, which are covered by a piece of tissue called the operculum, which is what we'll talk about. Um, this is what we see commonly in fish. And then, of course, there's the invaginated structure like we have, which would be lungs. So again, the, the development of lungs and gills um, allows for an increase in surface area due to all the folding and extensiveness of it, which greatly allows more oxygen to be exchanged. All right. So let's talk about challenges that animals have. Let me go back for one quick second here. Oops. Uh, where that? Okay. For a second. All right. So, what are the different challenges animals have? Um, and I'm putting, my primary focus is going to be on vertebrates, um, although we will talk a bit more about insects. So we're not really going to talk about the simple, like diffusion across the, the like with the plasma lemma. Really much. It's going to focus more on vertebrate respiratory structures. So one of the challenges obviously has to do with how much oxygen is in the environment. And where we live, we're very fortunate. Um, we have roughly in a, in a liter of air, there's about 209 milliliters of oxygen, about 20%. All right. Now let's go from sea level and let's go up. Say an extreme case would be Mount Everest. There the oxygen content is down to one-fourth. So that's one place where we see, obviously, animals that live high altitudes, whether it's birds primarily, right? Um, they obviously are dealing with an environment that has very little oxygen. So it makes you wonder, it's like, what do they have to do to be able to extract oxygen? They have a very fast metabolism from an environment where there's very little, right? Same challenge is with animals that live in the water. And if you take a look at the difference between fresh and salt water at different temperatures, no matter what scenario you're looking at, the oxygen content is very low. So say, for example, if we're looking at cold, say freezing, just above freezing, whatever, the, the amount of oxygen in fresh water is 10, the amount of oxygen in seawater is eight. Um, looking at um, high temp higher temperature, Think of 98.6 as ours, so this is somewhere in the 80s. Um, it's going to be around 5 or 4. Very, very low. So now animals that live in the water, is their metabolism fast? Well, typically not, well, unless you're a marine mammal, but they still have to find a way they need oxygen. How do you extract that little oxygen? You, you must have some really good respiratory structures and strategies for extracting oxygen. So we're going to take a look at some extreme cases. For example, um, the types of lungs that are found in birds. And also a little more about the gills and how those two situations between gills and bird lungs are probably the, amongst the most efficient ways of extracting oxygen because they have to right there in a low oxygen environment. All right, so let's start off with aquatic water. 
challenges for water breathers. Um, although we don't think of water as being viscous, right? We think of like honey and, and syrup being viscous, but water has a higher viscosity than air. So oxygen doesn't move as quickly. Oxygen is also relatively insoluble in water. So oxygen moves slow in water, it's insoluble. Um, and in different parts of water environments, oxygen levels can vary greatly depending on the depth that you're at. So animals that swim in different areas, they go from one area to the other, they're dealing with different challenges. So they're dealing with a situation where there's not only low oxygen, like you saw from the previous slide, right? But the, whatever oxygen's there moves slow and it's, it's not gonna rapidly get uptaken. So what do these animals have to do? The adaptation is of the, the evolution or the development of a very thin, which allows for rapid diffusion, high surface area structure, and those are the gills. High surface area allows them to maximize what their, the amount of oxygen, much like capillaries have a high surface area, allows them to maximize the amount of oxygen that's delivered to um, the tissues. All right. So again, this is a comparative class. We can look at all sorts of different fish. We can look at sharks, cartilaginous fish. We can look at rays. We can look at others. Um, you know, th there's variations between them. But so my main focus, though, we're going to focus on teleos. Teleos are bony fish, salmon, halibut, trout, a lot of those, barracuda, right? A lot of those. So let's take a look at the respiratory system of teleos. Even though I want to emphasize those other ones, too, also have um, similar systems, although not the same. And the respiratory system of teleos are the gills. These are the gills. Those of you that go fishing, or even if you don't go fishing, if you like to eat fish, um, you've seen gills before. Um, typically, you don't see them out in the open like this because there's a surface or a flap that covers them. How does it all work? How are they able to be so um, uh, uh, function as a gas exchange site? The, the medium, of course, is water. It's not air. So water enters into the oral cavity and before and the water also exits out but before the water exits oxygen is extracted from it so i'm going to show you how that's done all right so this is kind of might be hard to see but this is at various levels the breathing apparatus of a fish um, these are the gills right this is kind of a close-up view of all these different, what we call gill filaments. And each of these little, um, if you look under the microscope, you'll see these. Each of these little leaves or filaments greatly increases the surface area. If we were to focus just on one of these gill filaments, we would see something like this. Kind of looks like a radiator. These are called lamellae, right? And it's the lamellae within the gills where gas exchange occurs, okay? And if you take a look at this picture, just kind of follow the arrows, we have a blue arrow and a red arrow, okay? The blue arrow represents the movement of water as it's coming into the fish, goes across the gills. And the water, as you can see, goes, is going this way. In this picture, it's like left to right, right? Now, obviously, with, with the respiratory system, with gas exchange, we're looking at delivering oxygen from the water to the blood, right? The movement of blood goes, in this case, in the opposite way, what we call a countercurrent. Right? This is the blood that's going to the gills. It's deoxygenated, remember blue, right? And as the blood goes across the gills, right, it becomes oxygenated before it enters into those um, oxygenated vessels. If you remember, we we're going over the circulatory system, right? The blood enters the gills, oxygen poor, and leaves oxygen rich. All right, so just keep in mind that kind of a, we call a countercurrent, 
All right. Different view of it here is this is showing, for example, the, the mouth of the fish. This is the oral cavity, sometimes called the buccal cavity. These are the gills on either side, right? And they're covered by what's known as the operculum, like a flap. Water enters through the oral cavity and is forced over these gill filaments. And of course, as it goes over those gill filaments, it doesn't show it here, but blood actually goes in the opposite direction and oxygen is actually moved from the water into the blood. So the question is, this movement in opposite directions, what, there must be some strategy for that. You know, why, you know, what's so good about it? Why is it that the fish has this countercurrent mechanism? Okay. All right. So first of all, let's take a look, let's start from square one. Let's start from the typical breathing cycle, um, which involves inhaling and exhaling, right? So water is drawn into the mouth. We call that inhaling, you know, it's drinking water, right? Now, one thing I wanna point out, and this will become evident in the next few slides, is notice the size of this buccal cavity. Well, it, actually there's not really any, you can actually kind of compare it to that. Look at the size of that cavity and this one. This is larger. The, as water is being brought in or just prior, the buccal cavity enlarges. Here's a good example of talking about pressure and volume, much like we were talking about the respiratory pump, where the, the increase in volume of the atria draws blood up because the increase in volume decreases the pressure which draws the blood up. In this case, the increase in volume of the buccal cavity or the oral cavity draws water in. Once the water is in the, the buccal cavity, the buccal cavity contracts, decreasing in size, which increases the pressure, which forces the water across the gills. So we kind of call that inhaling and exhaling. So when the fish so-called breathes out, right, it breathes in this way and breathes out that way, which is different from us, right? We breathe in and out this, through the same structure, right? It's air goes in, air goes out through the mouth. And then in this case, air comes in through the mouth, leaves through the, or water enters through the mouth, leaves through the gills. And it's dictated by a pressure volume relationship. All right. Now, I spoke to you about the change in volume of the, uh, of the buccal cavity. Well, I also want to add something about the opercular cavity. Um, this, for example, is the opercular cavity right here. And you notice also the difference in size between the two. For example, with inhalation, the buccal cavity, the opercular cavity is large, right? the opercular cavity is small. Here what happens is, as water is coming across, the opercular cavity increases in size and the buccal cavity decreases. So this, just to kind of get you familiar with those two cavities. Even though technically this is not really a completely contained cavity, because it's kind of open to the outside, it's still considered a cavity. All right. So let's take a look at the breathing cycle. So as I mentioned, Water comes in through the oral cavity, through the buccal cavity, and what allows that to happen is the size of the buccal cavity, the volume increases, which decreases the pressure, which draws water in, okay? And, you know, some of it goes across in the opercular, okay? Phase two, phase two what, watch what happens too, in phase two, Notice that, look what happens to the opercular cavity. The volume actually is increasing, which is going to create like a suction that's going to pull more water across. Even though it's starting here, this drop, think of like a piston, this drop is going to increase the volume. It's gonna pull more water across, right? And then what happens the, towards the end this, the, the uh, buccal cavity decreases in size, so it's back to kind of low volume, high pressure, 
this, the opercular cavity is starting to push back up. So what does that mean? Now it's decreasing the volume that's going to push the water out. Right, so it's coming in through the oral cavity, through those different sized chambers, through the change in, in, vo in volume. So it's that pressure volume relationship that dictates entering into the buccal cavity, moving into the opercular cavity, and then out. All right, and I did some repetitive slides, but hopefully it's helpful. Um, this kind of looks like a radiator, actually, but. This is the water moving across in this direction, and this is the blood flowing, right, in this direction. And you can see right here, as it goes across, it's being oxygenated in the gills, which is leading to the, now we've got the blood vessels that are leaving the gills are oxygen rich. The blood vessels that were entering, um, entering the gills were oxygen poor. And if I can go back, Here's kind of a pretty good diagram right here, right? So this is the, the, the vessels that are first entering into the gills are oxygen poor, right? They go in across the gills, they pick up uh, oxygen from the water, and then they return through the, now they're oxygenated, and they go back to um, the different organs, remember, eventually returning back to the atrium after going to the systemic, to the systemic organs. All right, okay. So now we're gonna zoom in quite a bit on really what's going on here and a little bit more about this countercurrent mechanism. So this is a close-up view, again, here we've got the, and these vessels are called afferent and efferent. You know, we would like to call them often, often veins and arteries, but we call this an afferent vessel from other class, well, from, from talking about the nervous system, you know that an afferent nerve goes from the periphery right to the central nervous system. Think in this case, the afferent is going from the heart to the gills. The efferent is leaving the gills and going to the rest of the body. All right, so you can see again this countercurrent with blood flowing that way, water going that way. Okay. And this is just another view, right? Okay, now this is where I want to really emphasize the significance of the countercurrent and why it's so effective. Okay, so the best way to do that is to compare countercurrent with co current. And, and the co current would be if the water and the blood are going in the same direction. All right, so let's take a look at this scenario. All right, so say we've got, and we're just assigning these numbers. So say, for example, the blood entering the gills has little oxygen, right? Remember, that's oxygen poor, right? The oxygen it's going to get is from the water, which is this right here. Well, and you notice the arrows are going the same way, right? As oxygen moves from the water to the blood, and you notice it's by diffusion, right? High to low, high to low. Eventually what's going to happen is you're gonna get an equilibration where the, the oxygen content of the water and the blood are gonna be the same and you're not gonna get any more gas exchange. Gas exchange is going to be not really efficient because it basically comes to an equilibrium. Compare that with countercurrent. Oops. When, and you can kind of read this here. As the blood, so if you take a look, water's going this way, blood's going that way. As blood flows in the opposite direction to the median, picks up oxygen, it steadily encounters a medium of higher oxygen concentration, so that a partial pressure gradient favoring O2 diffusion is maintained. In other words, you're always going to have a gradient. Here, there's gonna be a point where there is no gradient. Eventually, this is gonna be 50-50. And once you lose that gradient, you're not gonna have diffusion. By maintaining the gradient, you're always going to deliver more oxygen. So that's the advantage of having the counter current. And you really need it with fish because again, no, very little oxygen in the water. Very little oxygen. And remember, oxygen doesn't dissolve in water and also it moves or, as, that well. And also, it moves very slow because the water is much more viscous than air. 
All right. So this is just a higher view of it, higher magnification view. And here it is right here. This is kind of what we're looking at, right? All right. So to kind of summarize where we're at so far is the secondary lamella are really the, the sites for gas exchange in fish. Remember that name, secondary lamellae. They're part of the gill filament. Countercurrent exchange occurs in those lamellae. Water flows across the gills in a unidirectional, in a unidirectional, oh, water flows across the gills is unidirectional via buccal and opercular pumps. And of course, that's meant to emphasize in contrast, as we'll learn with lungs, where you've got air going from the oral cavity to the lungs and then air exiting from the lungs back out to the oral cavity. Here you've got this constant flow from the oral cavity through the gills and out. Now, depending on the activity of the fish, there's a lot of fish that have to be continuous swimmers uh, because their metabolism is so high. Tuna, for example. Um, and tuna actually have, um, their, their we had time to talk about their muscle. It's really interesting, a lot of endurance muscle in, in um, tuna. But anyway, in order to be able to extract enough oxygen, just randomly swimming a little bit is not enough. These fish have to kind of go through the water with their mouth open, and it's what's called ram ventilation. You basically force the water across those gills to aid in oxygen exchange, and interestingly, to avoid suffocation. So the fish would die if they weren't able to extract more by ram ventilation. Okay, what about air respiration? So now we're in a different environment. We're looking at, well, if you're low down, or if you're close to sea level, looking at 20% oxygen. But obviously, if you're very high up, high altitude, it gets less and less. Let's first talk about probably the most primitive respiratory organ of an air breather, and that would be of an insect. Now, we've already found some really interesting similarities between insects and us. Remember when we were talking about cockroaches? Remember the uh, um, looking at the reflex with afferent nerves, right? Inner neurons, efferent neuro nerves, and then muscle contraction as the cockroach scurries away. Well, if you take a look at the respiratory system of insects, their system consists of this network of these tubes that permeate through the entire organ. And these tubes are called trachea. And of course, that's the name of our windpipe, right? The trachea. The insect does not have lungs, right? Um, well, how does it so-called breathe? It doesn't breathe through its mouth. It breathes through these little openings along the body wall called spiracles. <clears throat> Um, so, for example, this is leading out. It's an opening that leads to the outside world. These are called spiracles. Now, you might wonder, it's like, okay, well, what's, you know, how is it able to deliver all the oxygen to the organs? I mean, well, what's, what's the strategy here? Okay. Well, first of all, before we get to that, I wanted to show you, this is actually an interesting picture showing an insect. And if you can see all these, like, interconnecting little tubes. These are all the trachea. And right on the surface, it's kind of hard to see, these are all the spiracles. And they're scattered all throughout. They go from the, the head all the way to the back of the body. All right? Well, this is why this is a really efficient system for insects. It works really well. Um, first of all, is that here's the spiracle, which opens up to the outside. It's not always open, actually, it can open and close. Air comes in through the spiracle, in through the trachea. One of the interesting things is these trachea directly contact the organs. In this case, this is a muscle, right? You notice the trachea completely make contact with the muscle, so they're literally directly delivering oxygen to the muscle. They're not dependent on a circulatory system, right? Not directed on, on oxygen going into the blood. 
through lungs, going to the target organ. It's a direct delivery. So that's pretty cool, right? It works really well for the insect. Um, for us, it wouldn't work very well because, well, first of all, um, this type of system only works for small animals. And so this is actually, this type of breathing system is kind of why insects are so small. Thank God, right? Otherwise, you'd have these giant insects, like from sci-fi movies. Um, this is only good for delivering oxygen to small insects where they can easily access those organs. All right. So insects breathe using a tracheal system that connects to the atmosphere via spiracles on the body surface and continues throughout. Those trachea continue throughout the body so that the gas-filled tubes bring oxygen close to all cells. And as you can imagine, whatever CO2 accumulates, that is going to diffuse back out. Um, wait, 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 it's the same thing. All right, so this is just another picture of it, actually. All right. So we're going to make a rapid uh, movement from insects to vertebrates, air-breathing vertebrates. And we're going to talk about things, well, so if you think of vertebrates, right, we talk about um, air-breathing. So we talk about mammals, we talk about birds, we talk about reptiles, and we talk about amphibians right? Um, fish are vertebrates, but they're water breathing, of course, except for lungfish and ones like that. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to focus on the animals that have exclusive, um, can ex exclusively depend upon air breathing. All right. So in air breathing animals, we see the development of the lungs. And this is just a different type, different lungs in different vertebrates. This is a typical lung from an amphibian, more developed and, um, lungs. Here's even more developed lungs in reptiles, because if you think of the evolutionary tree, right, that amphibians predate um, rep reptiles, and then from reptiles to mammals, right? As we go from one level to the other, eventually ending up with mammals, as well as birds, I might say, we're going to see similar to what we saw with um, in fish is the fact that the development of a structure that has a very high surface area. And the mammal and bird lung has a much higher surface area than any of the other lungs. And again, these are the animals that have a very rapid metabolism, right? A lot of energy expensive processes that they have to do. Okay. So let's start off with amphibians. Um, I'm not going to talk about reptiles, um, amphibians. Um, what's interesting about amphibians is depending upon what their developmental state is, determines what is the respiratory organ. Yes, they've got more than one respiratory organ. Um, larval amphibians, and this would be a tadpole, right? Their respiratory organ are gills. As the animals go through a metamorphosis, right, they lose function of those gills and they develop lungs. What isn't shown in this picture, unfortunately, is that amphibians also have, adult amphibians also have a second respiratory structure, and that would be the skin. So we're going to talk about you know, why they have two, which one I mean, is more important, maybe depending on what environment they live in. All right, so this is going to address that right here. Okay, so with amphibians, we've spoken about three respiratory organs, right? We've spoken about the gills in the larvae. We've spoken about the skin and the lungs in the adult. Now, if you take a look at this, this is look, going from the, this x-axis, going from left to right, we're looking at developmental changes. And if you can see right here, in the beginning, the, the, the primary organ, and actually this depends on the amphibian as well, but if you look at the contributions of the gills, the gills are very important in tadpoles, but as with development, the, tad, the gills are no longer functional, they go down, 
But what does increase is the use of the lungs, right? Just like I said, gills, and if you think about it, tadpoles live in the water. <clears throat> Frogs, yes, they can, they can lay their eggs in the water, but they live on land, right? So they need that air breathing organ. Now let's throw skin into the mix, right? The skin is important, but how, how does its importance compare with the other organs? Well, it, this is what's interesting. It really depends upon what respiratory gas we're looking at. So if you take a look at these two charts, this top one represents um, oxygen exchange or oxygen uptake. And this is representing CO2 excretion, right? Because that's what we do with CO2. By breathing at it out, we're excreting it. We're eliminating it. Um, for, let's kind of do a compare between oxygen and CO2. Okay, so first of all, gills, um, in terms of, of um, CO2 excretion, gills excrete about 40% of the CO2 and the skin excretes about 60. So skin is kind of important throughout, um, whereas gills aren't and lungs aren't. So skin's always there, it just changes. So as far as CO2, the skin does about 60% versus 40% during development, right? This is during tadpole stage. Same thing is true with oxygen uptake. It's really the skin and the gills. So those are the two organs we only, that, are only, that are important during a larval stage. But look what happens as the animal develops. Obviously, as we know, gills, are gone in both stages. And all that's left as an adult are the skin and the lungs. Now take a look at this. The lungs are primarily involved in oxygen uptake. Very little contribution from the skin. Whereas the skin, is, its primary role is CO2 excretion. So it's interesting. So we've got now the separate separation of roles. And if you think of the, the picture of the frog heart, remember showing the blood that was come the pulmocutaneous um, circuit, blood coming from the lungs, blood coming from the skin. They're obviously delivering, bringing, uh, involved bringing blood and exchanging blood that have different compositions. All right. So just kind of as a summary, just to, to think of, the role of the skin. The skin is actually probably the, the most important in amphibians, as you can see. Um, whether we're looking at their role in an oxygen uptake or CO2 excretion, the highest is going to be, you can see right here with frogs or salamanders. When we get down to fish, right, the skin has very little function. And if you look at terrestrial vertebrates, right, the skin has very little function. And that kind of makes sense, right? With terrestrial vertebrates, our skin is much thicker, um, especially with reptiles, birds, um, and mammals, because we're, we're trying to prevent desiccation or dehydration. So the thicker the skin, this inhibits dehydration, but it also a thicker surface, we're not gonna have a nice respiratory surface. With amphibians, their skin is very, very thin, so becomes a very important respiratory organ. All right, let me see how we're doing here. Oh, wow. I'm gonna be able to get through this. Hot diggity dog. Let's see. Hopefully I'm not going through this too quickly, um, but we'll see here. Okay, so here we go. All right, so we've just spent a lot of time talking about the role of the gills in um, aquatic breathing, you know, the countercurrent mechanism to extract as much oxygen as possible. We spoke about the lungs and the skin of amphibians, and obviously, unless they're in the larval stage, then it's the gills. Now we're going to take a look at birds. Um, and whether you're looking at a goose or a sparrow or a seagull, right, they're, they're air breathing, right? So 
their lung, their, I should say, their respiratory organ are the lungs. This is a view of the bird lung. And obviously there's a lot of stuff going on in here. Um, to kind of help you navigate, let's start off with here. This would be where the trachea is, right? And the trachea opens up into this structure right here where we have these bronchi and we have these different air sacs. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all the anatomy, but I'm gonna go through a lot of features of the bird lug that make it very well adapted to extract a lot of oxygen, which is important, especially with these animals that fly at high altitudes. Whereas the secondary lamellae are the site of get for gas exchange in the gill of the fish, the parabronchi are the site for gas exchange in the lung of the birds, okay? This is the parabronchi, and there's a lot of these. I'll show you some microscopic pictures. What this looks like. Um, much like any sort of airway, let me go back here for a second, this is where you find the parabronchi, or through here, it doesn't show the details of it, but these are all parabronchi. Air flows through here, right? Air flows through here, but it's also in close association with these blood vessels, blood capillaries, whatever. And of course, just as you would expect, with gas exchange, we're going to move oxygen from the parabronchi into the blood vessels and move um, CO2 from the blood vessels back out. Okay, so the parabronchi is the site for gas exchange. Right. This is a scanning electron micrograph. Um, this is this opening right here is in here. These are all these little oops, what we call air capillaries. These are all these little air capillaries. You can see these right here. These are all spaces for air to go through. Okay. So let's get into the mechanism of gas exchange in the bird. Okay, so in contrast to the countercurrent mechanism that we saw in fish, where the water and the blood vessels are going in opposite directions to extract as much. The bird has also an efficient way that's not countercurrent, it's what's called cross current. And if you take a look, cross current, it kind of runs 90 degrees. Um, if we take a look at the air, if we take a look at the blood flowing in this direction, right? The air is always encountering blood at a lower oxygen concentration. So oxygen is going to flow from the parabronchi into the blood, parabronchi into the blood, always going to be, always going to be less, right? Um, so it's unidirectional. Now that term unidirectional, we spoke about that before. Remember with unidirectional, we spoke about with fish, how water goes from the oral cavity, goes across the gill, across the opercular cavity and out one direction. It doesn't go back out through the oral cavity, all right? Well, in the case with the parabronchi, it's somewhat similar, but not entirely. Okay, let's take a look. Picture this as the trachea. So let me just go back for a second. What we're looking, notice these are these air sacs. Let me just go back just to kind of familiarize you again. All right, so this is the trachea. These are these air sacs, these different air sacs along the interior. And this is where the parabronchi are. Okay. Air is going to come in through the trachea coming through the bronchus, through the mesobronchus, and it's gonna go all the way into what we call the posterior air sacs. Now, you might be familiar with what a bellow is, basically, or think of like a bagpipe, something that fills up with air, and then you squeeze it, and then in this case, the air, in this case, the air leaves. 
What happens, air goes through here, it goes to the air sacs, it's squeezed out, goes across the parabronchi, into the anterior air sacs, those anterior air sacs squeeze, and then the air goes out, back out through the, the bronchi. It's called unidirectional because it is kind of in this flow, although it does eventually go out the same way, right, unlike the fish. So let's take a look at the cycle, the breathing cycle. First of all, you'll notice that the color scheme, um, we have light blue and we have dark blue, okay? Think of light blue as fresh air that we just brought in. Dark blue, we call it stale air. I know that doesn't sound very good, but it takes a couple cycles of air going through the bird lungs for, air to be, for the air to be exhaled. It's actually two full cycles of inhalation and exhalation. It takes for a bolus of air to go out. Okay, so if we take a look here, air comes in through the trachea, through the bronchi, goes out into the posterior air sacs, and they're going to expand if you see the arrows, right? As that air is expanding, as that's expanding, there's already air here. That just gets push, pushed forward. And as it gets pushed forward, it goes across the parabronchi where it's going to be delivering oxygen to those capillaries, like you mentioned, you mentioned before. Okay. All right. Um, so, and then that air gets pushed across and this air is, is stale, right? That's inhalation. With exhalation, what happens, that stale air, right, is being pushed out because new air is coming in. New air is being coming in and it's going across and it's pushing air across here. This is squeezing, emptying the um, air out. So let me show you kind of in a better example. Yeah, here we go. So this is the whole picture, right? During inhalation, air comes in, right? Now, obviously, it's not, it's not a vacuum. There's air throughout this. So when air comes in from the outside, whatever air was already in, this right here, it's getting pushed across the parabronchi into these anterior air sacs. Where they, and this is old air that's already lost the oxygen, right? And then during exhalation, you can see right here, some of the air is, as it gets pushed across, much of the air is eliminated. Now, there's a little bit of air that comes back out this way, but very little. Now, one thing that is not, did I see this on here? Okay, well, I'll talk about this in just a second. So to kind of summarize, bird lungs um, consists of parallel tubes called bar parabronchi. Um, the the um, air capillaries and parabronchi are where the gas exchange occurs. The lungs are ventilated by the bellow action generated by expansion and compression of air sacs. It's a unidirectional airflow right through the mesobronchus to the air sacs, then across the parabronchi, then out. The, the gas exchange involved is called cross current. One thing that it doesn't say here, and I probably should have included another diagram that illustrated that, was that it takes two complete cycles of inhalation and exhalation for a volume of air to be exhaled. So for example, say you bring air in through here to the mesobronchus, it reaches the air sacs. That's inhalation. Then exhalation, this air leaves, which pulls this air across. More air comes in, which pushes it across further, right? Then we breathe out again. So two full inhalations and exhalations was required. So what does that mean? It means that there's two opportunities for the bird lung to extract oxygen. So it has twice the chance of getting oxygen. So it's very efficient much like the, the um, bills are. Oh, oops, eh, sorry about that. All right, 
Okay, so I'm just gonna introduce you to just a little bit here. Um, we've already spoken about lungs, the bird lungs. Um, this is the mammalian lung, and I might even add this would be the bird, the the um, not the 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 the, the bird lung, but the, just the mammalian lung. The birds and mammals have exactly the same heart, but the mammalian lung is different from the bird lung. Um, obviously, the same heart for chambers, right? Um, but because of the limited amount of oxygen that birds have to deal with, high metabolism, not only high metabolism where they use up oxygen, but there's less oxygen available high up, they have to have a very efficient way of removing it. Ours isn't as efficient, right? The air goes in and it goes out the same way, right? It doesn't take two cycles to remove that air, so there's only one shot to remove the oxygen. Granted, it's very good for us. We can get by with it, but it's not completely, it's not as efficient as a bird lung. Uh, one final note is we were talking about the sites for gas exchange. Um, the site within the lungs for gas exchange in mammals are the alveoli. And these are these, um, it doesn't really do this justice, but there's these little grape-like clusters. Each grape is known as an alveoli. And much like the parabronchi, much like the secondary lamellae, they're surrounded by blood vessels. So, and that's one thing with respiration, with the respiratory membrane. In order to be an efficient respiratory organ, you have to have a very thin surface, which is the parabronchi do, the alveoli do, and the gills do. And you have to be in close proximity, richly endowed with capillaries. So these are the capillaries. All right, so with that note, I am going to end this. Um, and I will be sending this out to you guys. And I will be posting in the next couple of days, Respiratory 2. Um, and I think that will leave the 16th for our review. So that's gonna work out good. Let me write a note to myself here. Review. And so I will be sending you out a study guide over the weekend. All right, everybody have a awesome weekend and I will see you Monday.